Okay, here we go. Welcome everyone. Okay, we will wait a few more minutes for more people to join us before we start. And um, we have our guests with us already, um, which we will introduce very shortly. Okay, we have people coming in. Okay, we will wait a little bit longer. Okay, there seem to be, ah, here we go. Okay, uh, Ned, you happy to start and then I'll just keep uh, letting people in as we go. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Nita. So it's my pleasure to open our session today with an uh, opening karakia. So that's kia ino tato, morioho, moritu, moriora kia tato, homie, kue, tai Okay, great. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, we do welcome you uh, this beautiful morning in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, we are uh, starting as uh, people are slowly jo joining us um, as well. Um, so, um, so we are expect that more people will be joining us in the next five to ten minutes. Um, welcome to this morning's webinar. Um, our colleagues from the Talzik Lianzak uh, group and the committee are here with us as well, and. Um, um, we have a couple of our colleagues who will be monitoring the chat room as well and answering your questions as we go along. Uh, today, we have a great privilege and honor to welcome our um, colleagues from the OCLC. And I can very uh, confidently say that this is a very first uh, international uh, webinar uh, Lienza uh, session uh, this year. We do have uh, and are working on um, inviting more guests and our colleagues and presenters from around the world um, in the next year as well. Uh, today we welcome our uh, guests from the OCLC uh, research uh, team, uh, their senior uh, program officers, uh, uh, Tizia van der Werf from Netherlands and Dr. Rebecca Bryant from uh, Columbus, Ohio. So we have a guest from Netherlands and a guest from uh, US. Um, I believe it's a midday and, and evening for them in their different time zones. Um, this session will be extremely, extremely interesting because it will um, introduce and give us opportunity to learn about very exciting and very large scale uh, projects and research projects uh, that OCLC uh, has um, conducted um, uh, uh, in the last year and the previous year, uh, ever since pandemic started. Uh, both uh, Tizia and Rebecca uh, have uh, conducted research and also have um, published a series of um, reports and publications and have also uh, presented at a few conferences uh, this year and past year that I know um, uh, that really address uh, global uh, trends in the library sector um, in the past few years and particularly focusing on the impact of the COVID on various aspects of librarianship. Now, today I will, I'm introducing first uh, Tizia. Uh, Tizia uh, has a, a really a broad experience um, in librarianship of more than 30 years. Uh, Tizia, Tizia is primarily interested in 
um, uh, digital uh, lib libraries, uh, digital uh, scholarship and librarianship, and open access and open science in uh, libraries. So she will introduce the new uh, uh, library model uh, that has stemmed from the research uh, that OCLC team has conducted um, in the past uh, couple of years. And that will be an extremely interesting uh, thing to hear. Um, after that, Rebecca will uh, talk about um, uh, research um, uh, information uh, management um, uh, uh, network and the uh, RIM related uh, research projects um, that she has been heavily involved in in the past few years. Um, you are all welcome to unmute your microphones and join in the conversation throughout their presentations. Both Dita and Rebecca welcome your questions, whether through the chat room or basically just uh, as a, a part of the ongoing conversation. They also have prepared several questions for our New Zealand audience as well. Uh, they would like to hear from you. They would like to learn from you as well. So this is more like a, a professional share, um, meet and share uh, a session where we all learn from each other. So I really welcome this morning our colleague uh, Tizia uh, from Netherlands and I will um, I will share my screen briefly uh, to um, uh, introduce Tizia's um, uh, presentation. So just uh, be very patient with me. Just a moment. Go. So I'm sharing my screen and here we are. Tizia, the floor is yours. Very, very good. Thank you so much, Neda, and thank you all. Um, so this is, uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to engage with, uh, with you all, with the Lianza community, and it's a great pleasure to be here virtually with all of you. So next slide, please. So Rebecca and I propose to present to you today some of our recent research projects, looking at them through the lens of the shift to open. The shift to open in libraries is about the growing impact on libraries and their communities of open access, open government data and open science policies and we are seeing this impact more and more in our different areas of research. I will talk about the new model library project and highlight the increased importance of open content due to the COVID pandemic. The pandemic really amplified the shift to open in library collection directions that already was under, underway. And so I will also shortly describe this trend to contextualize the new model library findings in a bigger picture. Rebecca will talk about her work on research information management and highlight the growing impact of open science and open access in that area. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, so before we start off, let me first briefly introduce you to OCLC research and what we do. Next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry, the <laughs> you're going too fast. The previous slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. So OCLC research has one purpose, to accelerate and scale library learning innovation and collaboration so that library leaders and professionals in the field can recognize and understand strategic trends, change operational practice and effectively serve their communities. Next slide, please. That was the, the slide I was talking to. So next slide, please. Thank you, this is the right slide. Um, our research programs look at how trends in consumer technology, online environments, supply and demand, 
are impacting individuals' informational behavior and libraries' responses to shifting conditions and ever-evolving community needs. Our research is also technical. We have a data science team that experiments with new technologies on library data. For example, applying semantic clustering techniques and machine learning to WorldCat data to enrich the data, to duplicate and disambiguate it. You can visit the URL provided on this slide to learn more about our different research areas. Next slide, please. So to accelerate and scale library learning and collaboration, we have the Research Library Partnership and Web Junction as our engagement channels. The OCLC Research Library Partnership or RLP is a transnational network of 130 plus academic and research libraries. Partners convene virtually in working groups and discussion groups to connect, share, and create a shared understanding around current areas of interest, such as research support, unique and special collections, resource sharing, next generation metadata, and more. You can visit oc.lc slash join RLP to learn more about the RLP partnership and how your library can become a, mem a partner. Web Junction is another program of OCLC Research. This is a learning platform for library staff with many online resources for free, including training modules and courses, webinar recordings, articles, and special projects. Unlike the RLP, Web Junction is not a network of peers, but like RLP, Web Junction is a strong, has a strong convening power. Last year, 24,000 plus library staff members enrolled in 15 virtual programs to talk about topics such as the opioid crisis, the COVID pandemic, community health support, equity, diversity and inclusion, and much more. So please visit the URL provided to learn more about this program. Next slide, please. So finally, we publish reports that consolidate our research findings in several areas. All are available as free downloads on our website using the links that you can see on screen. Our two most recent published reports are the new model library briefing and research information management in the United States. And we will be discussing these in this presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me start with the new model library project. As a part of our work in documenting how libraries as organizations operate, adapt and evolve, we wanted to understand how the pandemic will change the library model. Next slide, please. How will it change the essence of what libraries do and how they function as a result of the social and economic changes brought about or accelerated by the pandemic? Last year, we interviewed 29 library leaders with representation from libraries around the world. And our key questions to them were, how do you respond to the new operational context in this pandemic situation? And what do you envision for your library moving forward as a result of changing practices and environments? Next slide, please. The themes that came up in the interviews fall into three areas of experience, work, collections, and engagement. Next slide, please. 
So work experiences emphasized library staff work experiences. The pandemic revealed needs that informed library leaders about future staff priorities, such as work flexibility, staff well being, training for the future, challenging traditional divisions of labor, and rethinking organizational structures. I'm giving a very high level overview now of the findings. If you go to the report yourselves, you'll find much more detail. Next slide, please. Then we have the collections experiences. They came up quite a bit during the interviews and library leaders found that the pandemic was accelerating the shift towards the library on demand where users want resources immediately, conveniently, and in a format of their choosing. They indicated a future model library focused on realizing the full potential of e-resources, finding innovative ways to connect the community to the physical collection, and investing additional resources for loanable technology to support internet access and online activities in order to close the digital divide, which the pandemic has amplified. Next slide, please. And finally, engagement experiences. Having seen the strengths and weaknesses of virtual engagement and the power and limitations of the physical building, library leaders understood the need to shape strategic, complementary engagement opportunities going forward. They underscored the necessity of a hybrid approach to engagement around space and virtual experiences. The pandemic revealed the essential role of libraries as a community hub, and moving forward, this role should be retained. Finally, library leaders and staff partnered quickly with external parties of all sorts to address changing circumstances due to the pandemic. And this highlighted the need to partner with a purpose. Moving forward, leaders plan to be more intentional about new and existing partnerships to ensure that they add mutual benefit. Next slide, please. So during the interviews, open content came up quite a bit, unsurprisingly, in relation to the collections experiences. Next slide, please. The pandemic led to a surge in demand for online access. In trying to meet this demand, library staff increased the digitization on demand of physical collection items. They looked for free and open alternatives when access to paywalled content was blocked. And the interviewees reported an increase in demand for ebooks and experienced the access limitations to them. So they became more determined in negotiating increased access and sometimes even unlimited access per title. They worked in consortia to be stronger. And in some cases, this was done at the country level. Next slide, please. So there was even mention of a national consortium in Japan, which negotiated with publishers to increase the offer of open ebook content, as you can read from this quote from one of our interviewees. Next slide, please. And the utility of online resources during the pandemic helped to change both library staff and community mindsets vis-a-vis -vis open content. This quote from a college library director in Greece illustrates this well. Next slide, please. So what library leaders learned 
from these collections experiences was the need moving forward to acquire and support open content strategically in tandem with paywalled content. Some points to consider in a strategy that supports open content are listed in the briefing, such as forming partnerships with open access publishers, prioritizing, finding, evaluating, and incorporating high quality open content, particularly open educational resources. Those were mentioned very often during the interviews. Digitizing local record resources, particularly special and historic collections and connecting them to personal research and teaching interests in the community. And finally, supporting the community in the creation of open content by offering training and providing technology. Public libraries can do so through programming and interest groups, while academic libraries can do so through new and existing research support services. So I would be interested in hearing back from you, from the audience, um, what your experiences are with open content during the pandemic. So if you feel like sharing that in the chat, that would be really great and we can talk about it later. I will continue with the presentation now. Next slide, please. So the points I just mentioned are um, reminiscent of the findings from our open content survey from 2018. This survey was an initiative of OCLC's Global Council. And as you might know, we are a member governed organization and our members are represented in regional councils and a global council. And the council members very much support and guide our work. And they express interest in exploring the impact and the use of open access in libraries at the moment when the open access movement was gaining momentum. So we conducted a survey to take the pulse and to better understand the role of libraries in supporting open content. So here are the key takeaways from the 705 libraries from 82 countries who participated in our survey. And overall, respondents report that they are well invested in open content and they support its use across a large range of service category, categories. As you can see from the slide here, where there are 14 different categories of open content activities like supporting users, um, promoting the discovery of open content, open uh, data services, assessment of open content services, digitization of collections and making them open, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Libraries involvement in open content is growing and they want to move forward quickly. And they believe that OCLC can play a role in supporting their open content efforts, particularly in areas of selection, discovery, and analytics of open content. And this brings us to the last part of my presentation, in which I explain Lorcan Dempsey's collection directions and how these directions are impacted by the growing role of open content. So we'll move to the next slide, please. Over the past few years, Lorcan Dempsey, who heads our research department, has been talking in his blog and recent presentations in Belgium and Italy about three systemic ways in which library collections are evolving in a networked environment. They are moving away from the traditional collecting and diverging in three directions, the collective collection, the facilitated collection and the inside out collection. Time does not permit me to touch upon all three directions, but the shift to open potentially affects them all. 
I will, however, focus on the facilitated collection because that is the direction most impacted and accelerated by the COVID pandemic. As Lorcan explains, we have seen a progressive shift from the locally acquired just in case collection to the collection as a service, facilitating access to resources of potential interest wherever they are, not just locally. Next slide, please. The goal of the facilitated collection is to optimally satisfy user needs from a facilitated network of resources, whether they are locally sourced or collaboratively, whether open or paywalled, rather than to rely only on the careful construction of a locally acquired and owned collection. This facilitation includes a broad array of services, resource sharing, interlibrary loan, demand-driven acquisition, pointing people to a range of freely available resources via LibGuides, for example, or more purposefully coordinating access to open resources in a national open educational resources search engine, for example, or so so on and so on. And several pressures in the current environment encourage the trend towards this facilitated collection. Obviously, the budget pressures, but also the move online, which the pandemic has amplified, and the shift to open, which is amplified by open access, by open government data and open science policies and a focus on the readily available. As we have learned from our user behavior studies, an online environment favors the immediately accessible and convenient wherever it is available, and therefore it privileges open content. Next slide, please. So if you are interested in reading more about Lorcan's thinking on collection directions, I encourage you to read his blog. On this, slide, on this slide, you'll find the URL. And I would be interested to hear more from you in chat if you have heard or read about Lorcan's collection directions and what you think of it. Does it help you in thinking about your library's collection activities? and how to move forward and is the concept of the facilitated collection an interesting one for you to think about. That's my presentation and now I will hand over to Rebecca. Hi Titia, there was one, um, one um, question that came up or comment uh, a couple actually. Uh, Donna said that she had the example that they've had difficulty accessing accessing course con course texts over lockdown. It's led to the formation of an OER group to better promote these in the New Zealand in New Zealand. And Siobhan Smith said she's seen more interest in controlled digital lending as a result of the pandemic. So sharing those out in case you have any comment. I'm going to get my camera uh, fixed here for just a minute. I didn't get your full, I didn't get the first question, but the, yeah, the full digital lending, I didn't, we did not hear about that during our interviews. Okay. That came up later, actually. Our interviews were, um, were conducted in 2020 and this whole digital lending uh, issue started uh, coming up later, but it is very interesting, absolutely. I will read all what's in chat. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to do so while I was presenting, but I will uh, certainly read the chat now. All right. 
Okay, so I think you can see my screen. Can someone verbally tell me that they're seeing just my slides and nothing else? Yes, we are seeing all good. Oh, okay, but great. We, okay. But we, no, no, we are seeing your next slide and your notes, but oh, uh, is that a problem? But this is better. <laughs> yes, so, this is better. Right. right. Okay. All right. So wonderful. Hi, I'm Rebecca Bryant. I'm going to be talking about open science and open access mandates and how in my research, I've been noticing these are influencing uh, research information management practices. So I'm going to start with just saying a little bit about myself. Um, I've spent most of my career at a large research university here in the United States. That's the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, not in the library, but actually in another unit, the graduate school, where I had a lot of opportunity to collaborate uh, with the library on things like developing the institutional repository and ETD workflows <clears throat> and supporting open access in, in those ways. I also spent a couple of years as community director for ORCID and have spent time as uh, the project lead at Illinois implementing our RIM system. And so all of these things are, are things that sort of make my interest in this area uh, sort of logical. So uh, I'm starting with just making sure we're all on the same page about what I mean by research information management. Our new report out just a couple of weeks ago defines it in this way as a system to support the transparent aggregation, curation, and utilization of data about an institution's research. Uh, in the US, we call these lots of different things. Uh, in Europe, maybe where you are, I'm, this is a thing I'm actually curious about, you may call these CRIS systems, you may call them RIM systems. Um, we call them all sorts of different things because our landscape here is, is particularly messy. Uh, and since I joined OCLC about six years ago, we've now published five reports in this area. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do today, and all of these, there's a small link here at the bottom of each of my slides, you can, you can get to these. Uh, but what I'm gonna focus on today is really the last four with just as they relate to topics we've seen related to open access and open data, open science sort of issues. So, this report came out in, uh, I think, 2018, maybe late 2017. Uh, and we investigated, we did case studies of uh, persistent identifiers like ORCID uh, in European landscapes. So we studied the Netherlands, Finland, and Germany. <clears throat> and what we found that's relevant to our conversation here today was, unsurprisingly, that compliance, uh, therefore the title of national research assessments, these sorts of need for reporting that was required or mandated was really driving RIM practice. So these are the national assessment exercises like I know you have in New Zealand, but what we were also finding was the beginnings of some growth related to open science mandates that these two were beginning to influence room priorities. And they were beginning, as we saw, to influence some, some beginnings of really the need for greater uh, coupling between repositories and RIM systems. So we, we especially saw that in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and you know, in all cases, these institutions need to develop a, a university bibliography and increasingly need to track their progress towards open access. So a little bit about um, a second study that we did with the, the this is uh, a, a report that was published called Practices and Patterns in Research Information Management, came out about a year later in 2018. We conducted this in partnership with Eurochris and there's a lot of information going on this slide. But suffice it to say, what I, what I want you to know is that this was a survey. We had 381 survey respondents. Uh, in some cases, we had a great sample, like in the United States and in Italy and in Australia and terrific in the Netherlands. And it was really lousy in the United States, uh, which I speculate is because we are confused about what this term even means, but I digress. 
So what's really important about this was that we again saw that national research assessment policies were really important in defining what RIM practices were locally. But we also observed that open access policies were also exerting this influence. And increasingly, we saw the need for open access workflows as a, as a response to the requirements of either national policies or in some cases, local policies was really influencing you know, what, what we would describe as a emerging of product categories of, of RIM or CRIS systems with repositories. So either closer interoperability or in some cases just using one platform to, to satisfy both needs because, and this sort of comes back to the term convenience where um, often having a unified workflow for researchers is adding convenience to them because they don't have the time. They don't want to go to multiple places to provide, you know, you know, register their output and then go to another place to upload it. So we want to make the processes that that are required as, as convenient as possible. Uh, a few points here, going back just to, to national research assessments, the blue means that it's really important. So not surprising, UK, Australia, Italy. Netherlands research assessment workflow is really important in areas, especially the UK and Australia, where um, they're really strong ref-like uh, requirements. And then you look at the US and Canada and um, really North America is really this outlier because we don't have a, a national research assessment. When you also look at the importance of open access and the need for tracking compliance with policies, you see similar types of things. You still see really strong mandates in the United Kingdom. You see growing mandates in Australia and, and in, other, in other environments. And you again see this sort of North American, you know, nothing burger. And uh, really, you know, we had this takeaway as a, 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 a quote from an Australian participant who said that, Compliance with government regulations is the main driver behind RIM activities for them. So that brings me to the work that we've been doing in the last year or so. Uh, and we just report, we, we just released this report, uh, which I'm really excited about a couple of weeks ago called Research Information Management in the United States. Uh, I'm gonna say a little bit about this, but I wanna go ahead and make the caveat that while the report is really helping us untangle uh, the challenges of the US space. And there are a lot of things that I think are really unique about it. Um, I, there are some things that we've put forward in this report that we, we in collaboration with Eurochris wanted to be sort of relevant in any national environment. And that includes sort of a framework for understanding what RIM practices, you know, sort of the RIM uh, system components are both technical and functional, includes recommendations, and then includes understanding the diverse use cases that these systems may support. So uh, there's two reports. The one here in the dark blue is the one really with the findings where you're going to find that. And then if you really want to understand just how insane US RIM system uh, diversity is, then you can really dig in and read all the details in uh, the second part. So um, we chose a case study approach to investigate five institutions in part because we really learned from that effort, the previous survey, that we couldn't use a survey methodology. There was just too much uh, confusion uh, and different use cases that we really need to take a different look. So we chose these five institutions, all major research institutions in the United States, uh, because they reflected a, a diversity that would give us a really nice view of what was happening. And so what kind of use cases were they, they using? What kind of products were they, you know, were they using open source products? Were they using you know, an array of different proprietary products? Um, we didn't want to. We didn't want to do four institutions using the same product, for instance. 
were they operating at a uh, like a U.S. state scale, or maybe at the system with comprised of multiple campuses, or just one, or below, maybe below the institution? And we also were, as a library organization, we're really focused on what libraries are doing. But this is this is an effort that libraries are are always collaborating with other parts of campus on. So we wanted also that array of stakeholders. So in the end, we conducted thirty nine individuals. Uh, in 22 interviews at eight different institutions. And I, I know that there's five institutions here and eight institutions represented, which just also sort of represents how complex some of the information was. So again, what's relevant here for, for our discussion about open science? Uh, and so just, you know, setting it aside, we don't have a national research assessment exercise. And so we're not seeing that big compliance driver. We are seeing silos a lot because there are a lot of different uses for these systems. We're also not seeing a lot of driving uh, of um, compliance related to open access policies from funders with small exceptions. It's more the private funders where there's a need for the campus itself to uh, be doing tracking. But instead, what we observed in our case studies were that institutional open access policies are influencing the development of workflows to help make the registration uh, of, of publication metadata and then the upload of green open access content into a, a local repository the goal is to make it more convenient. And so we're seeing much more interoperability uh, between the RIM system and the repository. So that closer coupling is something that we're observing. So one of the key takeaways also of this report is that we discovered six use cases. Uh, so faculty activity reporting, annual review process, uh, a public portal, you know, where you can you can expose all of the, the researchers at your institution and all of the neat research that they're producing. Uh, and that can you know, help improve the reputation of your institution. It can also help uh, promote team science. So those are some goals for that. If you have that metadata, you may wanna reuse it on a website you know, for a department or program. So we saw that. And of course, we also saw the the support for strategic reporting and decision support. Uh, for us in the US, this is usually just for reporting for the institution because we don't really have that same need to report externally. So for us, it was really about strategic uh, planning and understanding the strengths of the institution, not for compliance monitoring. That's an important use case, but it's just not one we're seeing much of in the US. And then finally, we think that these open access workflows represent a really important RIM use case that sort of stands on its own. Uh, there's kind of a lot going on in this slide, but you can see at the top, those are the six use cases in the same order. On the left are the five institutions we did uh, case studies of. And what you can see is a lot of saturation of most of the use cases with the exception of compliance monitoring. And we saw it in just the tiniest of ways there at one institution at California. Uh, but we did see growth in these open access workflows with two that are, are in place and one that is probably coming at Virginia Tech University. Uh, so we do have open access mandates in the U.S., but for us, and we have for several years, it's, it's really quite complex because we have so many federal funding agencies. A lot of them actually have their own systems, you know, like uh, the National Institutes of Health has a way for institutions to interact with PubMed for the upload. So that's the, you know, that's the repository that that content needs to go into. So the institutional need, uh, you know, for tracking is, is sort of done within, uh, you know, resources uh, on the side of PubMed rather than um, actually needed in a RIM system. 
But additionally, I'll say that the burden of compliance is really placed on the researcher who receives federal monies in the form of a research grant, not at the institutional level. So another reason we're just not seeing that much change there. But the University of California represents a really interesting example. Um, and you're probably all familiar with the University of California. It is the largest higher educational system in the US. It is absolutely immense with 10 research universities and more than 250,000 students. Uh, and, but they have, so there's 10 campuses, each with their own library, but they do have a central library hub in the form of the California Digital Library. And what I find really interesting about this is that in 2013, uh, California, the system, uh, announced that it would uh, create an open access policy that required that all faculty, and then a couple of years later, all researchers, 22,000 at any given time, have to deposit their works within uh, the institutional repository. But the policy also says it needs to be as convenient as possible. So there's that convenience again. The result was that the California Digital Library built an interoperable RIM repository joint system. So, and, and my guess is that some of your institutions are doing something very, very similar, uh, either with your own repository or maybe with Figshare, uh, but they use elements for metadata harvesting. They take that information, they contact the researcher and say, hey, here's your publication. It's eligible for deposit. Here, click here to deposit and then a real simplified workflow. And again, this is managed on behalf of all 10 campuses for all of those researchers. It's so complex, in fact, that they're actually still implementing it. They have not rolled it out to absolutely every researcher. Um, and so again, this image, which actually comes from Symplectic, uh, really you know, in, on the left demonstrates that we're seeing more of this sort of close coupling you may have two systems that closely interoperate, and that might be through a locally deposit repository, like we saw at uh, the California Digital Library, or it might be through the Figshare repository, also from digital science. But what we're also seeing in the Netherlands, for, interest, inter, for instance, is that two thirds of Dutch institutions are currently using Pure as their institutional repository. And it's very much, driven by the need to make this uh, open access compliance and the tracking of it as convenient as possible, both for the libraries and also for the researchers themselves. Uh, and so I think I may just have, this is my last slide, is that takeaway is that through this arc of this research, We've really seen this increased coupling and even merging of RIM and repository product categories, which is really driven by greater convenience for researchers. Uh, and it's something I'm interested in continuing to explore. And if you have any comments about um, uh, your, your landscape here in New Zealand, uh, I'm really very interested. So please put that in chat or unmute yourself. And I think that now um, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and we may have some time for discussion. Wow, that it was really amazing. Thank you, Rebecca. It's been really, really fascinating to see the, the scale of the research projects and uh, the, 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 the actual essence of the findings was, is really um, interesting. Now, what I do, I could recognize actually um, through uh, all the uh, data you have shown us and findings that um, here in New Zealand as well, uh, at least based on my experience, um, is that uh, very similar shifts have happened in the, this year and the last year. And also that, that really enhanced collaboration between the libraries to uh, maximize the, uh, the mutual benefit of use of resources and resource sharing and supporting each other uh, in uh, subscriptions, uh, accessing content, sharing content um, has been uh, quite, quite uh, noticeable as well. Um, I would really like to just um, thank you for uh, both uh, 
really uh, insightful presentations. We really don't get to hear often in New Zealand um, such a really uh, broad and wide um, overview of uh, what's happening out there um, in other regions and other areas of the world, especially now we can't visit them and we can't uh, network with people. Uh, we do have a few more questions coming through. So I will just uh, pass it over to my uh, colleague, Siobhan. Siobhan. Yes, kia ora. Um, kia ora. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the New Zealand research in relation to two things you brought up. And one is around the RIMS Institutional Repository um, infrastructure and, that, and the other is in, in terms of open access, which I think um, um, myself and I think it was, it was a Phil, yeah, Philip, um, have been commenting on. So just in terms of uh, RIM systems and institutional repositories, um, New Zealand is interesting. Now, I, I must admit, I'm only speaking for the eight universities. I'm not including the polytechnics and other private training institutions here. Um, but for the eight universities, seven run symplectic elements. My university, Otago, is the only one that doesn't. We really technically don't have a mature RIM system at all here. Um, and there is a project called the Otago Research Information, um, ORIS, what's the S for? service <laughs> software, I don't know. Um, and we're also in the process of an RFI for our institutional repository um, because we're running on a very old, highly customized version of DSpace. So back um, about 10, 15 years ago, somebody can correct me on the date, a consul, which is our collective university librarians, um, put forward money and allowed all the universities to collaborate on developing institutional repositories using DSpace. Um, that, that is how, that is why pretty much all eight universities have or have had a DSpace institutional repository, but many are moving on. Um, a number of them have moved already into Figshare. Um, looking at the um, RFIs that we've received, um, it looks like uh, the big three that we've received um, is Exploro, um, Digital Sciences, um, Figshare, and also um, Elsevier's Pure. Um, and I really noticed, particularly with Exploro, um, but also with Pure and that and that, that real, as you said, that kind of the fact that a RIMS and an institutional repository is separated, you really see that convergence happening, particularly in those two products. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see how this progresses at Otago. Um, in terms of, um, as I said, other universities, some I think are still running their DSpace as well as Figshare, and I think some have wholeheartedly adopted Figshare as their institutional repository um, and have workflows already sorted so that that talks to their symplectic elements. Um, open access in the New Zealand is interesting. I did link to a paper um, that came out um, that was a console sponsored paper um, by um, a, a collective of librarians, including from the University of Otago, Richard White, um, which basically found that um, two out of five papers are made open access from New Zealand research. Um, and the reason why our, our OA is so much lower is because we actually haven't, in some ways, it's kind of interesting. We're kind of a hybrid between the US and, and the European experience. In the sense, yes, we do have a national um, research um, um, exercise, a PBRF, but unlike, say, the REF, there has never been any pressure for open access, either through things like the REF or through our major funders. Now, major funders tend to, most roads lead back to our Ministry of Business um, Innovation and Employment, MB. Um, there's the Health Research Council um, as well. There's a few, there, but yeah, for the vast majority of our funders in New Zealand, they are New Zealand funders and they do not have OA mandates. So there's no stick and there's no carrot, other than the fact that the research that Richard and co have done have kind of indicated that those, um, those, that, um, those papers that have been made open do tend to have a citation advantage um, and that the green path is 
pretty much just as good as the um, gold path. Um, because the other thing too is because we haven't really had the drivers for open, we have also not really had the drivers to deal with how do you pay for it. So um, there aren't really, some universities are better at others at providing that kind of funding for um, APCs, but yeah, the um, yeah. So the so the overall landscape in New Zealand is a bit unusual, but we are getting indications that there may be on the horizon um, serious conversations around the open access in New Zealand from that kind of government level and MB level, pretty much because Australia is now going there and New Zealand doesn't like to get left behind. So I wondered yeah. about that too, actually. Uh, that what what kind of uh, cross fertilization there or or peer pressure there was for you regionally in that regard? Yeah, uh, Australian universities are far better resourced, in my opinion. Um, you know they and that that makes keeping up with them pretty difficult. But it is yeah a um, yeah it, it is definitely something that we we have to do they are our kind of closest competitors and, and collaborators ironically you, you tend to be both you're both the competitor and the collaborator <laughs> anyway i will be quiet now and let others take over thank I would you just, thank yeah. you Siobhan. that was brilliant i i would just like to add to that it, um during my years as a librarian i i have become aware of and individual efforts of librarians who are involved in the uh, open access uh, uh, systems in New Zealand libraries across to basically um, uh, share metadata so that, for example, we have NewZealandResearch.org New platform, which harvests all our records from uh, open access repositories from New Zealand, mainly this space as well. Um, However, again, they are also they also have to apply, uh, comply uh, in terms of open access um, uh, permissions or restrictions as well. So often it's just metadata there, but not the actual material. Mm -hmm. But there are uh, efforts between librarians. They are almost um, hidden that do happen in to share data. For example, I know many libraries are putting their uh, open access thesis dissertations to ProQuest uh, thesis dissertations as well uh, with that's new for you oh uh, well not really new but i know i, I know so. that that's been happening quite um quite okay. quite often okay. now i would just like to uh, hand over to uh we have a very good uh comment from um uh a, a, a donna from aut uh who uh, have mentioned about their uh, future strategy in terms of using uh, DSpace. Donna, would you like to uh, join us and comment on that? Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, I've got, I'm on a different computer, so um, oh, I'm not really the one to talk about it, but I work on a scholarly communications team. Um, at AUT, we try to be open source, so we won't go to Figshare, definitely not pure. Um, but yeah, we are sort of in the early new year looking at um, repository tools too, um, to link the repository and research elements. Um, it's a big task to do. Uh, anyway, we're developing our own sort of in-house system where when you deposit into DSpace, it transfers all of that to research elements. Um, so it's going to, we're trying to make life easier. At the moment, research elements doesn't work well for green open access. Um, it was mentioned before, people deposit their um, published version for evidence for PBRF into elements. Um, sometimes they purposefully or accidentally push it through to DSpace. Um, I email them and say, hey, can we have the correct version? And I don't get a response. Um, most of the time. So we're just trying to push that green. We've also got an open access um, mandate, a, a policy going. Um, so it's just a way to try and increase our green open access in our repository. Okay, we have a comment from Rachel from uh, University of Auckland. Rachel, would you like to join us? Hey, Hi. Rachel. Yeah, hi, hi Nina. I was just listening in the background and commenting just to say hi to Donna and, and here at the University of Auckland we are using RT2 with 
do space and elements. So when you're ready to start looking at it, get in touch if you like, and we can have a chat. I appreciate that. This is a new product for me. So uh, not one I've seen used in the US or Europe. So glad, glad to know. I'll be digging around for it. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. I, Great. I just wanted to say that this actually brings up an interesting debate. And I remember attending eResearch Australasia a year or two ago. Rachel, you might have been there, actually. Um, it was actually Macquarie um, who led it. And it was around this kind of debate around open source, build it yourself, versus going for a vendor software as a service option. And the question was, it was actually around data repositories, um, although, as we know, the line between an institution and a data repository is blurring quite quickly as well. I think Figshi is probably a, a stand-up example of that. Um, but they were wondering why, for instance, nobody in Australasia was seriously using Dataverse, um, you know, the primacy of the likes of Figshare um, down here. Um, and it really is an interesting debate between those universities who, who feel that they, they want to use the open source software and they feel that they have the resourcing to sustain it because open source is free like a puppy, as they say. Um, <laughs> um, versus those libraries who are very much about, yeah, we in principle, we would love to support open source, um, but we don't have um, either the IT expertise within the library or that kind of IT expertise within the university um, IT um, services. Um, in order to be able to go down that route, we really need to go for a vendor solution where we just pay them a chunk of money every year and they do it for us. Yes, we understand that our own personal little needs may not end up on the roadmap, but um, we don't have to worry about you know, what happens when, because this is one of the reasons we have to really get rid of DSpace. Well, not get rid of it, but we really need to do something about it as such. I, I can't say get rid of it. We might still go for a DSpace cloud option yet. Um, but um, it's so highly customized. We actually have nobody in the university who can work with it. So we are currently contracting out to a gentleman called Kim Shepard, who pretty much all the New Zealanders here will know who I'm probably talking about. Um, and, you know, that our DSpace is probably one sneeze off Black Plague, to be honest. Um, it's running on an incredibly old version. We can't upgrade it It's because it's just... Yeah, it's just sad. So that's kind of the interest. So actually, the question I would actually have uh, for Rebecca, are you finding these same debates when, you know, that kind of vendor so offers software as a solution versus open source, do it yourself, kind of, you know, both in terms of the philosophical differences um, and also the practical, the practical options? That. The, that conversation is uh, very prevalent here in the United States. We saw it in it's, and I put a, a note here in chat that one of the institutions is very open source software. Uh, and so has implemented Vivo and has put a lot of resources to there. They still use elements for metadata harvesting because it just takes too many resources to build that. It's easier for them to buy it, but then, you know, they, they try to support as much open source as they can. But in the RIM ecosystem, there's much less build it yourself. Uh, there's much than, than in the repository ecosystem. Um, in part, I think there's just more maturity because you know, RIM systems you know, think, have been around for a long time thanks to the Dutch, so that we now have a very mature product category that, that actually is even older, I think, than some of our repository tools. So. Um, yeah, but it's we're we see lots of institutions that would like to be open source, but there's either not the product or they just don't have the resources. Rebecca, thank you so much. I believe this uh, will be our last question because we have to um, wrap up. Uh, but also, it seems that we have um, one more session out of this. Perhaps uh, we should uh, organize like an open discussion. Uh, uh, uh seminar where people where we can continue discussing mm. this topic as well because i believe that you know all of us working institutions um, um uh, you know especially with digitalized uh, collections we are uh, 
concerned and we are looking at different solutions as well. So thank you so much to everybody. This was absolutely um, really an insightful um, session. Um, we really look forward to and hope to see both Rebecca and Titi again uh, with us. Um, and I hope there will be opportunity perhaps next year for us to meet again and continue this uh, conversation as well. Um, 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 Ned, are you still with us? Yeah, sure. So Good. I can close Ned? our session today. Shall we, yes. shall we do the closing card? Thank you Absolutely. so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So, kia ino tato, Fakanoa e tene wahi, Fakanoa e tene korero, Fakanoa e tene tangata, e tene tangata, homie, hue, taiki. Thank you. I see still, still a few of you around. So, it's <laughs> been great chatting today. Sure. Go well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.